Greetings, this is Artie from Artifact Electronics. In this episode we're going to start talking about machine language for an 8-bit processor and specifically how that may relate or help us in uh, pinpointing a defect in a board that doesn't run. So we have a board, something, it's irrelevant what it is. Under normal circumstances we turn it on and we get expected behavior. The buttons respond. Anyway, things work. But what if we turn it on and it doesn't? Well, we start off with our normal sequence of hardware checks. First we check uh, power supply voltages something that uses TTL, regular LS TTL, uh, we need 5 volts and we need it to be within 5% of 5 volts. Otherwise TTL chips will start acting funny. This one also has a 12 volt supply. It should also be within 5% but it's not that important because none of the uh, digital logic is driven by the 12 volts. And other than that, uh, once we find that the voltages are good, then we turn our attention to the actual circuit. Always check the power supply first. Next we have, we look at the processor, the microprocessor. It has a crystal, it needs to be clocked. Some processors have a single phase clock, some have a dual phase clock. Look at the data sheet and look what it's expecting and see if the clocks show up. You can do this with a logic probe, but preferably with a scope if you have access to one, because a scope will show you things that a logic probe never can. The next most important signal to check is the reset signal. First find out whether it's supposed to be active high or low and then check it. See if it's in an inactive state. You want reset to be in an inactive state because if it's active it's basically stopping the processor. So let's say all of that is good but we're still not getting a peep out of this board. What do we do next? And uh, what does machine language have to do with that? I'll make up a really simple example here. So let's say we turn this thing on and nothing happens. Nothing lights up. Uh, it just sits there. We have voltage, we have clocks, the reset signal looks good, but it's not doing anything. Well, it can be one of many things we can have. There can be failure in one of the chips, the ROMs may be bad, the processor, even though it's getting the proper input, is not functioning correctly. Even though that doesn't happen as often as you would think, especially on older CPUs. If they still work nowadays, they'll... they'll uh, if they work for all this time, they're still working. So this is where being able to read machine language comes in handy. And I'll make up a simple example. Let's say the machine code in this, once the processor starts up, for some reason insists that none of these buttons are pressed. Or let's say this button isn't pressed. So what does it do? The CPU goes in after boot up and it reads the state of this button. And if it reads that the button is pressed, it just sits in a tight loop and says, I'm going to sit here and wait until you let go of that button. Now, under normal circumstances, if you have displays and stuff, you should indicate that that's what you're doing. So if I have my hand on this button and I turn it on and it won't do anything, it should at least flash like a bunch of zeros or an ER or something on here telling you you're doing something wrong. Even better, flash a code and you look it up in the manual and if code 7 is flashing, it says take your finger off the first button. But that is generally not done because uh, there isn't enough ROM space to do all of this. In this particular instance, there's, uh, there's a 32KE PROM here, and uh, there's really 
no room left over for any <laughs> error messages on boot up. But if we had, let's say this is happening now, we're not pressing the button, but it's still not starting up. Why? Because something went bad with the traces on the other side, a wire got cut, the resistor burned out, whatever. But because of a defect, electrically, this switch is always closed, whether you're pressing it or not. Or the switch itself failed and is closed permanently. So what happens is you start, you start up the system, the processor goes and reads the switch, and it goes, I'm going to stay in a tight loop, keep reading the switch, until the user lets go of it. But the user can't let go of it because he's not pushing it because it's defective. So at this point, it would be helpful to actually have a look at the code, be able to read the code, and after a few minutes you will immediately see that in boot up, it's sitting there waiting for something to happen. You'll see that it's falling into a tight loop and it just keeps doing it over and over again. And that will tell you very quickly that, hey, it's reading this switch, but the switch keeps coming back as closed. At which point you go and test the resistor, you test the switch, and lo and behold, you find that the uh, cheap push-button switch has broken internally, or is shorted internally, and you pull it out and change it, and things are fixed. Now, I'm not saying that if you only do hardware analysis, you wouldn't find this, but uh, this is probably not the first place you'd go to to measure to find out, hey, is this thing stuck closed and is that maybe the reason why it isn't booting up? If you have an opportunity to look at the code, you will see what's happening on boot up, especially when nothing else is lighting up when you're turning it on, and that'll help you isolate the problem. And here's the subject of our episode the Atari 8-bit microprocessor. Never heard of it, neither have I. It's not an Atari. It's, uh, it's a Motorola 6800. And I guess when Atari bought these, they had a special. Buy a couple thousand of these and we'll personalize them for you for free. It's called house marking. A lot of companies do that because they don't, when your processor breaks, they don't want you to go out and buy an off-the-shelf 6800, but rather go to Atari or whoever supplied the chip and buy their maybe overpriced replacement part because you're not too sure about what it is and you should always buy replacement parts from the original manufacturer. But anyway, there you have it. Uh, this is going to be we're going to be talking about the innards of this and what makes it run. Now, an important topic to discuss before we jump into the 6800 are different number systems. We're all used to decimal. That's what we use day to day. That's how most of our heads work. And it's base 10, which means each digit in a decimal number can take on a value between 0 and 9. Why do we use the decimal system? It may have something to do with the fact that most of us go through life with ten fingers. Uh, well, also ten toes, but I don't think that if we had seven toes or eight toes normally that it would have... As long as we have ten fingers, the decimal system is what we use every day. There's really not much left to explain. I mean, it's a decimal number. 187. That's a decimal number. Now when we start dealing with different uh, number systems, we need a way to denote what that number actually stands for, which is not always obvious from looking at it. So to be absolutely clear, we give it a 10 subscript, which means 187 is a base 10 number, and uh, there's really not much more else to say about it, I, I guess, unless I brought a, a bowl of marbles and represented this number with marbles in different piles and stuff like that, but I don't, I don't think that's necessary. <laughs> Let me know if it is, and 
I'll make a special addendum. But that that's the easy one. The problem is decimal is kind of inconvenient for programming a microprocessor because a microprocessor is binary and ones and zeros and all that sort of good stuff. And there's other number systems that we should use or we can use to make it easier to write machine language. Well, the granddaddy of them all is binary or base 2. And as the base indicates, is each digit can hold a value between 0 and 1, or I should say 0 or 1. So binary number would look something like this. Let's say 1010. Now remember, we only allow zeros and ones. If there's any other symbol in this number, it can't be binary. How do we convert this to decimal? Well, we take the first digit. We basically multiply the digits by two to the power of by two to the power of sequential integers starting at one. And also we're for now we're also only going to talk about integer values because it gets kind of nasty when you get to binary and you have to start dealing with real numbers. But the way to convert this number is we take the first digit and we multiply it by 2 to the power of 0. We add to it the second digit and we multiply it by 2 to the power of 1. And so forth. So, by looking at this, we can see immediately that this equates to 0 plus 2 plus 0 plus 8. 2 to the power of 3 is 8. Yes, 2 by 2 to the power of 3 is 8, so we have 8 plus 2, and that is equal to 10 decimal. Whereas properly marked, we know that 1010 base 2 equals 10 base 10. It is kind of convenient, more convenient when we're dealing in the digital domain to talk about bits. Problem is the numbers can get kind of big. So <clears throat> if we take an 8 bit an 8 bit binary number and we say this is the number 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, 1. Now, if we take it through this procedure, where we, of course, have to use four more powers of 2 to convert this to decimal, but it comes out to 253. So this equals... Two fifty-three in decimal, and that's fine. It's not that difficult to do. My advice is, uh, I mean, don't treat it as a multiplication table. Don't try to uh, memorize all possible eight-bit values, all two hundred fifty-six of them. But I think it would be very helpful to you to be able to do an 8-bit conversion between base 2 and base 10. You don't have to, but uh, it's, uh, it's a nice mental exercise. But things now start getting a little more difficult because even though it's an 8-bit processor, which means most of the internal operations are done on 8-bit numbers, we have something else like an address. We need to address, whenever we address or deal with memory, read or write from it, we need to give it a numerical address in our code. And uh, most 8-bit processors have an address space of 16 bits. So when, when we say 8-bit processor, we generally refer to how it works internally. It's not 100% true. The 6800 has some 16-bit operations.
that it performs internally, but all the memory fetches are are eight bits. So yes, it is an eight bit processor, but now we want to go somewhere in high memory, we need sixteen of these bits, and that would look something like this. Zero one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And another eight bit, just for ease. So what we have here, we have 16 bits. You can convert this to decimal using the same thing, except now you need eight more powers. I mean, eight more powers of two as compared to an eight bit number to convert this number to decimal. This is extremely inconvenient to write in your code and extremely error prone. There are certain situations where this becomes useful and I'll get to that later, but obviously binary or base 2 is not the answer to our problems either. So here's a number system that makes computer programming somewhat easier than using other number systems. And it's called hexadecimal, hex for 6, decimal for 10, base 16. One uh, pet peeve of mine is this is one of the most misspelled words that you read in computer programs or comments or stuff like that. Even in some uh, quasi-academic papers I've seen it misspelled. And This is the uh, major misspelling of it. Hexadecimal. If you can't write hexadecimal, if you can't spell hexadecimal correctly, come on. Maybe it's just, as I said, a pet peeve of mine, but that really bugs me. Anyway, uh, we get to now base 16, should already give it away. We have each digit can take on a number between 0 to 15. So, of course, we have 0 through 9, but now we need more symbols for the numbers 10 to 15 inclusive. And what, what, what was chosen? Wisely so, or maybe not, but you get used to it, is basically a 10 is represented by an A through F for 15. So, a hexadecimal number digit can take on any of these values. So what does a hexadecimal number look like? And we're going to stay with small numbers because otherwise there's huge numbers we have to deal with, but uh, let's say we have 2a, which is a hexadecimal number, and actually is kind of easy to recognize because there's an a in it. And anything that is below I mean, uh, base 10, this is obviously not a base 10 number because no uh, base 10 number can have a digit that's 10. So it already gives us a hint that the base of this number is uh, greater than 10. So now we have a base 16 number. How do we do that? Kind of the same way as in binary, except the powers of 2 change. We take the first digit, 10, and as before, multiply that by 2 to the power of 0. Now we take the second digit, but remember, this is a, a single hexadecimal digit is equivalent to four binary digits. So now what we do is we multiply that with 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, which is 2 to the power of 4. So basically that plus this, this is uh, 2 times 32 plus 10 times 1 which is 42 decimal. So as you can see, just glancing at this, it 
there really is no easy correspondence between this number and this number. But in order to picture something, you know, if you want to load the number of times you want to make an LED blink, and you're loading a 2A, there's few people that can look at it and figure out that 2A means 42. That's why I mentioned earlier it's of great use for you to be able to convert 8-bit hexadecimal numbers to decimal. It'll make your programming task a lot faster. Now, the advantage is obviously this is much more compact than binary. In binary, this number would require eight digits. And we brought that down to two digits. And that may not be seem like such a big deal when you're dealing with numbers less than 256, which requires eight bits, but if you're doing a uh, memory access and you gotta have, you know, in binary it gets ridiculous with 16 digits. The problem is that in uh, uh, with decimal, it's not very intuitive. 64K, which really is a misnomer. 64K of memory is in decimal 65536. So 64K of memory is 65,536 bytes. But if you look at it in hexadecimal, this is all also equal to 64. So there you go. Which means in a 64K system, the last, this is the size, so the last accessible address is actually F, 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 F. And uh, that's the way, that is the most compact way of representing, I mean, there are more compact ways, obviously. If we went to base 32, you know, it would have the number of digits, but now all of a sudden we would have almost the entire alphabet in there allowable for for a digit and it becomes unreadable again so i think hexadecimal is a go is a good compromise for compactness of the numbers and uh, being able to read them kind of getting an idea i mean it's not expected for anybody to know that ffff is 65535 in decimal but you kind of get an idea after a while when you see an address what range of digital it's in. Now, we use subscripts to denote the base of a number, but that doesn't work too well in an assembler. That basically lets you write an assembly or in machine language. So, for the 60 for the Motorola 6800, the convention is that if you have a number with no prefix on it, it is interpreted as decimal. So it tries to read this number and as long as the number consists of uh, digits between 0 and 9, the assembler will take this and uh, create an internal representation of it that the processor understands. Binary, on the other hand, Here's a binary number. Yeah, we can't put a subscript there. That doesn't really work too well. Especially not 30 years ago when you didn't even have descenders in your character sets. But you use, on the 6800, you use a percent sign as a prefix. And that tells compiler it's binary number, or the assembler. I keep using them interchangeably, but I should be saying assembler. And... Uh, yeah, if there's anything other than a 1 or a 0 following the symbol, the assembler should spit it out and say it's an invalid binary number. Hexadecimal, on the other hand, 
See, if we write 2021, it will automatically, standing alone, be interpreted as a decimal number, 2021. But if we want a hexadecimal number, put a dollar sign in front of it. And that tells the assembler that, hey, what you're reading is a hexadecimal number, allowed digits are 0 through F, or 0 through 15. There are, an assembler should also take care, of course, that if it, you know, that when loading in a number, they're usually limited to 16 bits. So if I tack on another digit here, the assembler should spit it out and say the number you're creating is too large. But that's basically it. We will be doing most of our numbering in hexadecimal, some in binary, and binary is good for initializing stuff. Let's say you have an external chip that has a mode byte, like a serial chip, and every bit basically means something else, sets, sets up something else in the serial chip. In cases like that, it makes more sense to use binary because you have a one-to-one -one correspondence between bits and what they actually, what option they set in, the, in that particular chip register. So for readability's sake, it's better to use binary when writing something where every bit, where the whole thing isn't really a number, but basically every bit controls something else. For small numbers, uh, for small numbers, use decimal. It's easier to read. You want to make an LED blink uh, 67 times. You might as well write 67 rather than the hex equivalent. What is that, by the way? And that was going to be my next thing. Is uh, Some of you may be asking, why are you wasting all this time? Use a calculator. Either a real calculator or whatever comes with your operating system to do this stuff. That's because, you know, a man, an actual physical calculator is more fun. And uh, so what did I say? I said 67. We want to make the LED blink 67 times. And this one we just convert back and forth in hex. It will be 43, which is totally non-intuitive. I mean, as a matter of fact, it could cause you to chase your own tail because if you just kind of glance over that line of code, you see a 43, and then you see that the LED is blinking 67 times. You may want to figure out why it's blinking too many times. Well, that's because the number you're looking at is hexadecimal. Of course, we can go to binary, and that's what, it, that's what 67 looks like in binary. It's actually 7 bits. They cut off leading, uh, leading zeros in here. Let's see, what if you give it something that uses, that needs more than 8 bits? So if we say in hexadecimal, so now if we say binary, it puts a dot there saying that there's more to come. Not exactly sure what you're supposed to do here. I don't see any left or right arrows, but internally it is keeping track of it. But uh, I'd have to read the manual on this thing to figure out how do how do we scroll this thing left and right to see the rest of the number. But yeah, have a calculator to do most of your work. But you should be you should be able to do eight bit numbers in your head. I'll, Okay, I, say, I, I said that for the last time. And the very first, last number system that, uh, that deserves mention is octal, which was used in the old days. Octal is base 8. And basically what that means is that each digit can contain a number between 0 through 7. And they used that in the early days. In the early days, you know, you would buy a $4 million computer and it would have like 2K of memory in it, so octal kind of work, but nobody uses it anymore. So I'm not going to spend any time on it, but you can approach it just 
convert octal to decimal just like we did with binary and hexadecimal. And that sums this up. Well, that took a little longer than I thought it would. So uh, we're going to have to stop here. And uh, people are yelling clickbait, where's the 6800? Well, it'll come up really soon. What you're looking at is the environment we're going to use to run and examine and talk about 6800 machine language. It's a simulator I wrote for some other stuff and did a quick conversion. You can see a picture of the Heathkit 6800, the ET3400 6800 trainer there on the bottom, after which it's patterned. It can run that, but it also can run standalone code and uh, give you a really good explanation of what a 6800 does and how it changes everything as you're stepping through the code. So like, subscribe, comment, share, and we'll see you at the next episode.